Boris Johnson, the odds-on favorite to become Britain's next prime minister, had one distinct advantage going into the race to succeed Theresa May, name recognition. When the UK media dropped that name, Boris, Britons know exactly who they're talking about. As it happens, the news business is where Johnson got his start, where his troublesome relationship with the facts first surfaced. Back in the late 1980s, after getting fired from his first reporting job for inventing a quote, Johnson wound up as a correspondent in Brussels, where he produced a slew of flimsy, Eurosceptic stories that readers found amusing, stories that could well have sowed seeds in people's minds for an eventual Brexit. Fast forward 30-odd years, and there was Johnson, a key asset on the Leave side in the 2016 referendum campaign, saying the same kinds of things about the EU as a politician that he once did as a journalist. These days, the British media finally seem to have clued into the fact that entertainment value isn't everything, that Boris Johnson falls dangerously short of the qualifications for the job. But he already has one foot in the door of 10 Downing Street, so this media awakening is looking like too little, too late. Our starting point this week is London. We live in populist times. In 2016, Americans elected a former reality TV star, a triumph of sound bites over substance, to the White House. You're fired. Last year, Italians voted a party formed by a comedian, Beppe Grillo, into a coalition government. Two months ago, Ukrainians elected another comedian, Volodymyr Zelensky president, in a landslide. Where does Britain's Boris Johnson fit in? He's part entertainer like Donald Trump, part comedic sideshow like Grillo and Zelensky. Or, as one British columnist put it, Johnson is a character, which lets him get away with things a serious politician wouldn't. Mr. Johnson's unseriousness, in short, is his most effective political weapon. And that's a pro-Johnson voice writing in a paper that wants him to be prime minister. Boris Johnson comes across as a sort of amiable buffoon in a long tradition of upper middle class British characters. It's not really what he's like at all. He's ruthlessly ambitious. The idea that Boris Johnson gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror and says, what can I do for the common man today, is palpable nonsense. He is concerned only with his own advancement. He is a huge opportunist, but he also has engaged in really, really toxic forms of politics. Legislation that is detrimental to marginalised people in Britain. So harsher laws for asylum seekers, harsher uh, laws for immigrants. And that is overlooked in favour of thinking about him as this character of fun. We in Britain, we're facing exactly the same problems that the American press is, is facing with Trump, which is how do you hold a liar to account? And in this day and age, it's incredibly difficult because our media is very largely owned by oligarchs and they're overwhelmingly right wing. And you can see concerted elements of the press working together to promote their man, which is Boris Johnson. Beautiful day. Johnson is well aware that most of the UK print media do have his back but not all of them. And when The Guardian broke a story this past week that a neighbor of Johnson's overheard a domestic argument between him and his girlfriend and was concerned enough to call the police, Johnson's carefully calibrated amiable buffoon act was put to the test on the airwaves. Can you just tell us what happened at your partner's home a couple of nights ago? Police were called to your house in the early hours of Friday morning. These papers will print whatever they're going to print. Well, that story from? dominated coverage of Johnson this past week at the expense of another significant expose. Last year, reports emerged that Johnson was being advised by Steve Bannon, the alt-right former White House operative who has ties to white supremacists. Bannon was reportedly behind President Trump's efforts to ban Muslims from entering the U.S. Johnson repeatedly denied that he and Bannon were working together. But just last week, this video of Bannon came out, shot in July of last year. He's going to give a speech in Commons today that's going to throw down. He just went back to the Daily Telegraph as a columnist. I've been talking to him all weekend about this speech. Carol Cadwallader broke that story in The Observer. 
Isabel Oakeshott is a former political editor at The Times, a paper that has employed Johnson. They see this story in distinctly different ways. You know, I, I, I email Boris Johnson's press advisor to get a comment. And first of all, he says that it's just not true. And then I said, well, you know, we've got, we can, we, you know, we've got video of Bannon saying otherwise. And then he said, oh, 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 oh I'll come back to you. And instead he came back to me and said, oh, it's just all a ridiculous conspiracy. They dropped the denial. I think this is all nonsense. I don't think Boris has a particularly close relationship with Steve Bannon. Boris knows all sorts of people, and I'm sure he's taking and listening to advice from a wide variety of characters, some more reputable than others. But it doesn't mean that there's some kind of conspiracy cooked up here to take world politics lurching to the right. Perhaps not, but less than a month after Bannon made those comments about working with Johnson, mentioning the Daily Telegraph, this appeared in the paper. A column written by Johnson, Trumpian in tone and content, saying that Muslim women who wear the niqab look like letterboxes and bank robbers. We don't know all the specifics of the relationship between Boris Johnson and Steve Bannon, but in another way, it doesn't matter. What matters is that he is trading on exactly the same kind of politics that Steve Bannon is. Boris Johnson likes to ramp up the hatred towards certain groups of people at particular times. And at this moment, that is ramping up hatred towards Muslims, which is an existing sentiment in Britain. The Daily Telegraph and Boris Johnson have a relationship that goes back decades, one that has had an impact on British journalism and politics. Johnson made his name as the paper's Brussels correspondent from 1989 to 94. There, he hit on a formula, filing stories on the arcane bureaucracy of the EU, pointless regulations that supposedly mandated the size of bananas and condoms, or threatened to make some of Britain's favorite snack foods illegal. That the stories bore little relationship to the truth was of no apparent concern to Johnson or the paper employing him. Johnson's reporting helped set the tone for the way the EU was seen in the UK and eventually for the Brexit referendum of 2016. What Boris Johnson's Eurosceptic journalism did was stoke the simmering Euroscepticism within the Conservative Party. But possibly more important, it set the tone for 25 years of British media coverage of Europe because every news editor in Fleet Street thought that what Boris Johnson was producing was much more interesting than the usual grey, dull fare that came out of Brussels, and they demanded the same. I know this because I was a Brussels correspondent for three years myself at the end of the 1990s. So come the referendum, you know, the, the, the referendum wasn't lost in, in those five weeks, whatever it was, in June 2016. It had been lost over the previous 25 years. Can we blame Boris Johnson for Britain's fundamental Euroscepticism, tracing that back to a couple of decades ago, almost, when Boris was churning out these ludicrous stories, exaggerated stories? It was immensely colourful, made great copy, and people lapped it up. But I'm sure also people took it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. <laughs> Boris Johnson's ongoing relationship with the Telegraph remains central to his political ambitions. Because the current Prime Minister, Theresa May, resigned before her term was up, her successor will be selected on July 23rd, not in a general election, but by the Conservative Party membership. And until then, the Telegraph will continue to provide Boris Johnson with a weekly platform, a direct pipeline, to the 160,000 Conservative Party faithful who will choose Britain's next Prime Minister. The Daily Telegraph is the Bible of the Conservative Party, and our next Prime Minister is being chosen not by the British public, but by the 0.25% of the electorate who happen to be Tory party members. So his column in the Daily Telegraph is immensely important to him. I think it's quite extraordinary. To me, it breaches every code of journalistic ethics. I cannot understand how he or the Telegraph gets away with it. If the politician and the paper do get away with it, it will be because the line between politics and the press in the UK, between those elected and those supposedly holding them to account, has long been blurred by mutual self-interest.
Boris Johnson is just the latest beneficiary of that. And if the polls, prognosticators, and bookmakers have got it right, he'll ride that relationship all the way to 10 Downing Street.